This episode of the Adam Messer Show podcast is brought to you by ValhallaBooks.com. ValhallaBooks.com, their inaugural anthology is called The Devil's Do. Nothing is ever as it seems. You can get more information at ValhallaBooks.com. All right, welcome back, everybody. And you are tuning in today to WRUU LP Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRU.org. We are Savannah Soundings Community Radio with Global Soul. This is the second hour of the Adam Messer Show, and I'm your host, Adam Messer. My special guest today is Ryan Dunn. Welcome back, Ryan. Thanks for being here today with us, man. Hey, how's it going? Good, good. And everybody tuning in, we are, uh, if you're just now tuning in right now, that we're right in the middle of our fall pledge drive, and so this, this year has been just a crazy year. So um, I'm going to read this to you. Through this pandemic crisis, WRU has continued to bring you our award-winning music and information programming, but this pandemic crisis has added to our fi- uh, financial fiscal drain- strains. <laughs> Tongue-tied there. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> to fund WRU operations, we depend upon a number of local events, including our Spring Fling and our annual Tunes and Brews concert and celebration. However, these have been postponed as a result of the recent shelter-in-place orders. As a result, we are asking you as a part of our WRU family to give on Giving Tuesday to make your donation on WRUU or to increase your donation to ensure that we can continue to bring our programming that you have come to love. Go to the WRUU website, which is WRUU.org, and click the donation button to make a donation of any size today or on Giving Tuesday. Thank you. So, yeah, we are uh, we're a nonprofit all community radio station. We're all volunteers. Um, we don't get paid. Uh, we do it because we love it. This is my going into my third year of doing the radio show, uh, which I really enjoy because I talk with authors and artists and entertainers. I get a chance to talk with uh, folks like Ryan Dunn. Um, and, you know, so thank you all for your support. This year has been crazy. So I know I know people have been getting hit up left and right for donations and things like that online. But uh, this is how we fund our sh- our shows, you know, through listener supported donations. So thank you very much. And if you haven't donated before, um, please just consider even a dollar going to wru.org. If you're listening to the podcast right now, um, same thing, you know, because like honestly, I I pay for the funding for my podcast fees. The station doesn't pay for that. Uh, but I'm asking you to give your donations to the station because I can't do the podcast. Well, I could do the podcast without the station if I wanted to, but I really don't want to. I want to do my radio show, and I post my radio show as a podcast. So thank you all. All right, so that's the spiel right there. We've got, uh, we're going to have a couple more um, at the mid-hour break. But we were talking uh, last hour, Ryan, about um, you know just your tours and the investigations and stuff like that. I'd like to, uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to – go back on to the afterlife tours.net website and play um maybe a couple more of these evps and then you could give us a breakdown of them yeah of course man all right so everybody um the afterlife tours.net it's uh, ryan's website for their tour company here in savannah and i'm gonna play uh the chart house one it says uh, a child's voice okay so it's, this one's called the chart house Light. okay let me turn that off i I thought I had that off. <laughs> nope, I didn't. I just wasn't playing it. There we go. All right, so we're on the computer here. All right, this one's called a chart house. We're brand new. We got some. Like all my boards today, I cannot talk before it. We're brand new guys. I just heard it, yeah. Okay. So what what was that, Ryan? So there's a little girl that died in the building. Uh, the chart house sits in an old slave warehouse built in the 1790s. So, uh, so the building's had a lot of history, and there's a little girl known to haunt the main area on the main second floor and first floor. And we had just arrived for the case that night, and we're walking through, getting our base readings, holding an EMF detector that picks up electromagnetic fields. And all of a sudden, the EMF detector started lighting up very, very high. There was no paneling in the walls or nothing that could have, you know, give us a rational explanation for it. And right after it lit up, 
our recorder picked up a little girl's voice that says, can I play, which is what you heard. And it sounds like a little kid, and we think it's the same little girl haunting the building. We think when we came, she came up to us, the EMF detector picked her up and lit up. And she thought it was some type of toy because it was lighting up, and she asked, could she play? Mm. That is uh, really <laughs> creepy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that was uh, that was awesome. There were no kids in the building at that time. We were locked in. Period. Yeah, that's that's really creepy. Um, what do you think about it when you you catch stuff like that? Like, did you hear it when it happened, or did you hear it like on the the playback? We heard it on the playback, and uh, I was I was blown away because you know it, it lined exactly up with what they had reported about a little girl haunting the building. We had a little girl recording, so it was just amazing that it coincided with the activity they were saying was going on there. Mm-hmm. You know, I got a question for you because, like, you know, we were talking about how you approach it from the historical aspect, and right. that there are a lot of people out there who kind of hoax this stuff or whatever. Right. You know, you well, you hear something like that, and you're like, like the skeptic in me is like, you know, that could that could just be an overlay. You know what I mean? I know you though, and I know that you wouldn't fake something like that. So, like, can you talk about that in the industry and, like, you know, why it, it's a, a problem? Yeah, unfortunately, there's people that like to monopolize on people's grief and on death and things. Um, and that's why I always tell people if they ever want to see it for real to join us on an overnight and they mm-hmm. can see it. Mm-hmm. And um, that's why on the overnights we do the live playback. That way, if we get anything, We'll hear it. You'll hear it, and we'll play it back while you're right there. It's unedited. It's, nice. it's just raw. Right. And there's no way that, you know, you're standing there watching us, seeing that we didn't manipulate anything in any form. Yeah, because I'm a big fan of, like, uh, ancient aliens and stuff like that, and I like those, like, you know, videos that people, you know, put out there. And it seems like almost every time, like, a video, it, you know, like, like, let's say a Bigfoot, you know, like the Bigfoot thing or whatever, it, they always come back and say, oh, it's some kind of, you know, hoax or whatever. And it just blows me away because there is so much out there that you don't know what it is. Right. Yeah. But, like some with, people just don't want to believe it. I think. Yeah. But with the, the way that you do your investigations, the way your team, you know, y'all lead the way that this goes, you look for the historical aspects of the building of the time period of the people that are involved. And, you know, it just adds, I think another layer of, um, authenticity to it, you know? Right, and that's our biggest thing is having you know the most authentic ghost tour that can be possible. Yeah, and I like the fact that you just present what you find, and you're not trying to convince people. You know, I mean, because right. there's so many people out there. Uh, you know, I'm sure that you've had the heckler or you've had the you know the the skeptic on you know a tour, you know before or whatever. Yeah, and what's interesting, I'm like, if you're really wanting to see proof of it, you know, join us on an overnight. You know, a tour yeah. is going to highlight the history and what's happening. Some people have been on tours, and one of the funniest complaints I ever got uh, happened one time after I did a tour. And the lady said, I didn't enjoy my tour. And I said, do you like the history? Do you not like me as a guide? You know, what could we have done better? And she said, well, I didn't see a ghost. Hmm. And I looked at her seriously, and I said, do you expect us to be able to show you a ghost on the tour? That would be and crazy. She said, well, it's a, she said, well, it's a ghost tour. And I said, well, they're not on our payroll. You know, yeah. I can't. Yeah, you if can't just were, call I'd them be up. The guy in the world, if I can make a ghost appear. Well, you know, you know that, but she, she was upset we couldn't make a ghost appear for her on on command. That's crazy because you know the thing <laughs> that it makes me think of is like, like exorcisms. You know, like yeah. the, the Catholic Church they perform exorcisms, and you know, like demonology and stuff like that like there are a lot of forces out there you know I, and i'm not trying to push my beliefs on anybody here everybody okay right. but i'm catholic i believe in god i believe in jesus and i i do not believe in pushing or proselytizing my beliefs on other people okay so i'm not i'm not coming from that perspective i'm not trying to tell anybody to convert okay um i have a, i have a friends from varying backgrounds you know and i believe that everybody has the right to their own belief systems I know from my perspective that there are things out there that we don't know. Right. There was a movie called the right with Anthony Hopkins. Right. Did you see that? that. Yeah. Okay. So that's based off of a real life priest. Yeah. Okay. And the thing is, is that over the years, you know, the Catholic church has probably the largest library in the world and they have, 
you know, I know, I know people think that the church is like anti-science. They used to be, but the church actually has a huge scientific foundation. And, you know, so there's so many things that we don't know and we don't understand, you know, but I do believe in like, for example, like I know you said before that you get your holy water from um, Saint, the uh, cathedral right here. Right, the, right, yeah. You know, and when you're out on investigations and stuff like that, um, you know, these unknown forces, this phenomenon that's out there, you know, I, I don't want to sound crazy or anything like that, but, you know, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of stuff out there. We don't know what's going on. There's a lot of danger, and that's why I find it funny, you know, people like Lady on the tour that I couldn't produce a ghost. And I'm thinking that if it really happened to her. You know, you don't know if you're dealing with a negative spirit or, a, you know, something friendly. And yeah. you don't know what you're trying to challenge. You're wanting it to be something, you know, for entertainment purposes. And that's not the way the spirit world works. You know, yeah. I do it for a living, but we respect the dead. We respect these people. They were humans at one point, mm -hmm. And they are souls, so they deserve the respect, you know. Well, you know, and the thing is, too, is like um, my grandma, Greta, she used to be able to read cards. And, yeah. you know, she would have these... Um, I don't know, not premonitions, but it's, I guess that's the closest thing I could, you know, relate it to. But, uh, just like with gypsy, uh, folks, you know, like I know a lady, she was actually a gypsy and she read cards and she read yeah. poems and stuff like that. And, um, you know, they're Romani. She was Romani, but she was a gypsy and, um, right. She, you know, I, I used to do computer repair for her. Really nice lady and all. And she read my poem one time and it just gave me chills, you know. And so when you're when you're out there and you have like, you know, let's say you have a client or whatever that that's like that. I mean, it it, it kind of reminds me of like how people think that things are going to be like Hollywood when they move right. um, to wherever. Like, you know, say let's say they, they live somewhere else and they move to the U.S. And they're like, well, why isn't it like this or why isn't it like that? It, right. It's because they have this perspective in their mind of like it's going to be like this on TV. Right. right. And I think I remember one time you told me um, that you had you know, somebody, one of the, you know, at, at some point a producer had asked you to kind of like almost kind of like not fake something, but kind of like fake something. And right. you're like, no, I'm not going to do that. Yeah, I've had to put my foot down because my credibility is the only thing I've got in this business. Right. If I lose it, uh, you don't get that back. So we have to do everything. You know, factual. I'd rather lose 15 seconds of fame on TV than lose my credibility in this, in this field. Yeah, because I mean, like honestly, there's so much stuff out there. It's crazy enough as it is without having to fake stuff. Yeah, you know it, that's it, how I look at insane. it. You've done, like you said, a couple hundred investigations. Yeah, probably a few hundred now. So it's been uh, it's been a long journey, but it's been really cool. It's been fun. What uh, what was like maybe you know top two or three that you could think of that you know really kind of put you out and they're like whoa. Um, I think one of the scariest places we did was Waverly Hills Sanitarium. It's a four-story tuberculosis hospital up in the mountains in Louisville, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, we were in morgue tunnels. We were in morgues. We were in surgery suites with big surgery lights where they did, you know, deflated lung methods. And it was it was insane being accessed an entire hospital for 12 hours. Yeah, I, I feel like um, – I think you and I were talking one time about – like with the EVPs or whatever, you know, cause the earth has the gravity and magnetism and all that. And that these, you know, our body has electricity and our body has, you know, these different elements, the same elements that are in the universe and all that. And that these spirits, they're almost like a recording, you know, right. Uh, being, you know, like the spirit kind of just reenacting an action from that person's life or whatever in that place, especially if they, you know, had a violent death or whatever. Um, what, what was something at the, the hospital there that, you know, came like, just kind of popped up and you're like, Whoa, we need to get, um, get away from so this. Up on the, the rooftop of the hospital, there's like a little half fifth floor area called the solarium. And that's where they would take the patients and let them get some sun. It's also the children's ward was. And, um, if you ever watch the ghost adventures episode, they show a photo of some kids playing on this creepy old swing set made out of old pipes from like the early 1900s when it was a TB hospital. And the swing set's still up there, but they've since broken it apart. You know, it's laying in pieces, mm -hmm. and you can still see the old wooden swings laying on the ground in the fifth floor area. 
Well, one of the children ghosts they have up there is a boy named Timmy that died of tuberculosis. Mm. And uh, people bring a ball. He's been known to roll the ball and play and stuff. So we brought a red ball up there, and uh, we had a video camera on it. We're recording audio and video. And we said, Timmy, if you're here, can you move that red ball? And after we played the audio back, a little boy's, a little boy's voice says, I can't. I'm sick. Mm. Which back then when kids had TB, if they were bad off, they weren't allowed to play because you'd get them coughing and having coughing fits, which right. they were required to have bed rest. So we think Timmy was just doing what he was told and wasn't allowed to play because of his tuberculosis. Oh, wow. Wow. Well, we got to do the station announcement real quick. Um, <clears throat> that is crazy, though. I actually, um, real life story, I had a friend uh, that his sister had tuberculosis and she died um, when we were like, I think I was about 10. Oh, wow. So, yeah, it was, hear that. yeah, it was, it was, you don't hear about it very often, but you know, yeah, now because of nowadays, yeah, it's wild to hear about that. Even back then, it was real rare. I was like, oh my gosh. Right. So, um, everybody tuning in today, thank you. Um, through this pandemic crisis, WRU has continued to bring you our award winning music and information programming, but this pandemic crisis has added to our fiscal strains. To fund WRU operations, we depend upon a number of local events, including our Spring Fling and our annual Tunes and Brews concert and celebration. However, these have been postponed as a result of the recent shelter-in-place orders. As a result, we are asking you, as part of today's Giving Tuesday, to make your first donation to WRU or to increase your donation to WRU to ensure that we can continue to bring you the programming that you have come to love. Go to WRU.org website and click on the donation button to make your donation of any size today or on Giving Tuesday. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's something, Ryan, that, uh, you know, life, the, the cycle of life, we all, you know, are mortal. We're going to, we're all mortal. You know, we're all going to die. And uh, we, hopefully, you know, we, we live a good life and we enjoy our lives or whatever. But, you know, there are a lot of folks that have had a bad break in life. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so, especially here in Savannah, like, you know, the slave quarters, you know, Savannah was like one of the big ports, always has been a big port, you know, with slave trades and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, Savannah's had, uh, you know, pretty, uh, pretty, pretty, I don't know how to say it. Um, Violent history. history. Yeah. Yeah, Brutal violent history. Yeah. 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 Uh, What was something that you learned about Savannah that, you know, kind of blew you away um, that most people might not understand or know about, even locals might not know about? Um, You know, I love our city and I love the fact we're a big tourist city and we cater to tourists. But one thing I don't like is the way, like, you know, they mentioned, you know how you mentioned slavery. Mm-hmm. Savannah, with its connection to slavery, was huge back then. And it seems like the city likes to downplay it just to help tourism. You know, they don't want to bring it up or rehash it as much. Mm-hmm. Uh, for instance, in 2009, during renovations to Calhoun Square, they discovered the original slave cemetery there. Mm. So that was 11 years ago. And there is yet to be a monument posted in that square acknowledging there's a slave cemetery there. Oh, wow. Um, so I just feel like Savannah... You know, of course, everyone knows there are slaves here, but there's really not a lot of monuments to the slavery and what happened with the slave trade. I think the city doesn't want to do it just because of, you know, it isn't a proud history, but it shouldn't be forgotten. I mean, these people should be remembered, and it's yeah. something I think should be definitely be brought around, more, brought about more, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think, um, you know, we could do better uh, overall with remembering the folks that came through here and that didn't make it out so yeah and just remembering i mean all all our past wasn't all you know you know rainbows and butterflies and most of america wasn't but i think remembering that and talking about it makes people acknowledge it a lot better than just trying to candy coat it or act like you know i've heard a lot of even tour guides say oh there's a few slaves here i mean no it was a huge slave city you know it was Mm -hmm. not just a few here and there Mm-hmm. And I just feel like people don't acknowledge it enough, you know. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Let me uh, let me ask you too on um, like the investigation side or whatever. Um, how did you, you know, I don't know if I've ever asked you this, but how did you get involved in and interested in doing um, the investigations, and how did you decide the, you know, the way that you were going to to do conduct the business and all that? 
because oh. you know the, the way you do yours is is different than like you, you know it is entertainment value but you know it's more to me like your stuff's more like a historical tour yeah it's, it's definitely a historical tour with the leaning on like you know the history we talk about the dark history the murders the deaths the you know, the epidemics, the wars, the battles, basically the stuff that when you're in history class that you really wanted to pay attention to. You know, the stuff that people, it sounds bad, but people like the gruesome stories. Yeah, yeah. So, of course, we stick more to that with our tour, but it is all fact-based. You know, we're still telling the truth. Um, it's not hard to get gruesome or scary when you talk about amputations in an old Civil War hospital or talk about, you know, what someone went through trying to fight or live through yellow fever and then mm-hmm. dying tragically. Um, but, yeah, we moved here... Uh, in 2010, me and my wife, we loved the city and wanted to move here, and we married in 2007. Um, so three years later, we came down here and decided to live our lives here, and we moved into a house that was built in 1888, an old row house, and in the first you know, few nights, we started having activity. Um, you know, but prior to that, ever since being a kid, I've always had a passion for hauntings and ghosts and love reading and hearing about it, but it was neat to be living in a house where it was truly happening. Um and then we started doing, you know, setting up recorders and playing around just to see if we get evidence. And we were getting EVPs and things in our house. So uh, we started a team and started doing research. And, you know, now, now it's a full-time thing. Um, the tour came about because in 2013, we've been investigating for about 10 years at that point. And there's no money in the in investigation. We don't charge for overnight for research. So we don't make money from that. Um and we were taking a few ghost tours, and the stories we were hearing were places we'd done research at. And me and my wife were like, look, this isn't even true. And so we decided to open our own tour to fund our research. And mm. now I'm able to do it full time, which is nice. That That is cool. What did you do before uh, the tours and all? So I was in the restaurant industry. I actually met my wife in a restaurant. We were servants and, bar- and a bartender. And then I ended up going into restaurant management. Oh, and, wow. Um, so I was, we planned on opening a catering business here with our restaurant knowledge and then, you know, branching that out into our own restaurant. But, you know, 10, 11 years later, we're still doing ghost stuff. So it's, I think it's so, it, but I wouldn't change it. So I think it's so cool. I mean, honestly, I think it's so cool because, um, you know, like with the, with the writing and, um, you know, I, I wrote, I published my first vampire book, um, blood thrasher in 2018 and I wanted to do something fun, you know, with it. And then, you know, this year I decided, well, I've been doing the Savannah Quill thing. I mean, like, you know, you were a special guest at the the convention and all, and you've been a big supporter of it since we started. And um, I did that because I was like, you know, I want to, I want to do something for the indie authors and all. And then this right. year I wanted to, you know, it's, it's just interesting how things kind of turn about. Cause I, I didn't make any money. I, I actually spent money out of my own pocket for the conventions, you know? And, That's how it was ghost hunting. Yeah, it's costing me money to buy all the batteries and everything. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, it was pretty expensive to you know to fund the, the convention, even even you know selling booths uh, for like fifty bucks a pop. It was you know I was still out of pocket of quite a bit of money, and but it went from that to you know pub, indie publishing to this year starting a small publishing house, you know Valhalla Books here in Savannah. And I love it. I mean, like, I just think it's so much fun. It's a lot of work. It is a lot of work, though. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I, I think it... people tell me, they're like, oh, you run your own business. It's got to be easy. You don't have to do anything. I'm like, yeah, right. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't do the tours, but I mean, the marketing and the, the payroll and the Kim does payroll, rather. But, you know, I mean, the stuff we both have to do. Yeah, but you just running, you just stopped easy. doing the tours, though. It's not like you haven't been doing the tours. I mean, like, right. And before that, I was doing tours six nights a week. I don't want to do Yeah. You just and, you just leveraged up where you could you know be off of the the beat instead of you know being on the beat. Yes, that's nice. Uh, and I'm even busier than before, but um, it's been nice doing other things, you know, focusing on the business out, and you know, doing a lot of marketing, a lot of other things it requires to make it really run smoothly and get us business. You know, so what do you um what do you say for like because you're an author as well, you know, and that's one of the things I really think is cool. Um, you your books are about your investigations right? right so what do you say because you know you're like we, we talked about yours is not a fiction book it's it's right. more like a historical paranormal you know research book or whatever um what do you say for for those folks out there you know that want to do something similar i mean because there's a couple other groups out here in savannah that they do you know they're doing investigations and stuff like that or whatever 
Um, and there's a lot of tour guys out. I mean, there's a, well, I don't know how many are left now because of the pandemic, but, um, what do you, what do you say for that? I mean, like the folks who want to write their own book about, you know, spooky, scary stuff. I mean, it's definitely, we definitely have some competition. I think we're always going to have that, but, uh, somehow we've been lucky enough to get into places nobody else has been allowed to ever get into. Um, but I did Pirates House in 2013, the manager or the uh general man or excuse me the ceo said you guys are the last ones that's going to get in here and film um so <laughs> we've gotten into places that mo- a lot of places have not been allowed to get into um pirate's house Wormslow plantation pink house i mean some places that just you know ballastone in marshall house kehoe house places that just don't allow investigators um and we've been lucky to have those contacts i get a lot of people from other teams asking me all the time how'd you guys get in there can you guys get us in there you know it's Mm -hmm. um we did the old chatham county jail before it got turned tore down and us and nick groff from ghost adventures were the only two teams to ever get in there Mm. and we filmed with nick when he did it you know so Mm -hmm. it's uh i guess just keeping it to the ground and knowing you know i guess who we know has really helped us get access to stuff that nobody else can do what about writing the book though like like because the investigations are a separate part like i mean obviously you have to you know get out there and you know find it or whatever but like how do you know do you do you kind of look at it like from an investigative reporting aspect or how do you Um, approach the the writing part of it it's interesting i realize that you know all of our ghost stories whether it be in the book or on our tours kind of have a three-part piece mm-hmm. one's kind of the history of what happened there um both true and fiction you know people say this but here's what really happened mm-hmm. the other part's the interview thing which is you know okay what goes on here you know who you know who, what, what are the employees seen you know what have the guests seen in this building type of thing mm-hmm. or if it's a private home what are the owners of the homeowners seen um and then the other part is what happened while we investigated so those three parts comprise any story or anything we do whether it be a book or a tour and then it's just a matter of getting it all down on paper. And honestly, it's just like, it's like throwing it all up on the paper. And then I come back and look at it and it's horrible, but I have everything I want there. And it's First draft. Yeah. It around, yeah. It's a matter of just really moving it around and making it sound really smooth. And I do have to select what history I want to put in and what I don't, you know, I can't do the entire year by year history of every story. It'd be very boring, monotonous. Mm-hmm. And, it would, read, so it would select, read like a grocery list. <laughs> right. So I got to hit the select, you know, the, the fun history. Who died there? Um, you know, who, what, what did so, so and so have an affair? You know, these type of, these juicy tidbits, like this gossip that people want to read. You know, that's what I have to look for. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, 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 I'm always curious. Like book, you know? Yeah, I've always been curious because um, with my background in writing, um, <laughs> I was, been a freelance journalist for the Savannah Morning News and I try to look at it from the human perspective you know like who are the people involved with all the stories that I do and I feel like that you do the same thing with your writing that you you know you talk about you know, the period the time period you talk about the places but you focus on the people and I think that brings a, like another element of realism to it because it's not, you know, like when we talk about James Stark, I, I keep bringing that up cause I get to play that role and it's just, you know, kind of a, one of the, I guess more famous ghost stories around town, but you, you talk about him and you talk about Dr. Minus, you know, these were real people. They weren't just like some kind of fictional character. They were real people. Like if we right. lived at the same time as them or they live the same time as us, we know these characters, we know the, over the top, you know, people that are just loud mouth, you know, bruiser types that are just a bunch of blowhards. We know those folks. Yeah. You know, and uh, we know we know these other types of personalities, you know, we see them. And I think that's an interesting. Um, I really think it's an interesting way to present the uh, the investigations because you incorporate those same investigations with your tours. Right. And then you let people decide for themselves. I, I don't like when somebody tries to persuade me. I cannot stand when people try to sell me on stuff. Right. Like, you know, you go into, you go into a big box store and they're like, hey, 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 mister, uh, who's your cable provider? Not I interested. That, yeah. <laughs> not interested. I've already got cable. Oh, but uh, but you're not. Do you, do you have the same one that we're at? Yes, I have the exact same one that you're trying to sell me. But uh, do you don't have this deal. I'm like, why don't you just leave me alone? <laughs> You know, I can't stand that. One of my favorites is Kim gets a lot of telemarketer calls for some reason, and she always knows when it's a telemarketer, she put it on speaker on her cell phone. Yeah. 
And the first thing she'll do when she answers the call is she'll say, there's blood everywhere. I got to go. Oh. And stop and listen. Oh, that's <laughs> that's super good. silent for a minute. They always hang up. Like, but it's just like, like huh? I can't imagine Deed. what they're thinking on the other end. They're like, Dee. Yeah, so. <laughs> That, what's that what's that one line if you see something say something line i can't remember it's yes, a, it's just it's just fun man i recommend anybody with have some fun especially during halloween if you get a telemarketer call don't get I gotta upset go, there's just, blood everywhere yeah you know there's something out there really crazy you know something that they can't answer you know yeah all right so we've got to do uh everybody we're doing the fall fundraiser event for wruu i'm asking uh just please think about it and uh so here here it goes we need your support. All of the in-person fundraising events we normally have throughout the year have been canceled because of the coronavirus. Supporting WRUU with your financial gift is very important to us. Some of the largest expenses that WRUU pays each month go to bringing you the actual over-the-air signal that you listen to and enjoy. We pay rent on our studio location, and we have a monthly tower rental fee. We have internet and telephone fees. We have broadcast engineering fees to fix our connection between the studio and the tower when something goes wrong. We pay fees for all the music we play and separate fees to stream our music broadcasts. We have no salaried staff and very few administrative expenses. Everyone is a volunteer. So rest assured that your contributions go directly to bringing you the programs that keep you stimulated, entertained, and informed. Individual donations account for most of our income each year. Do your part today. A contribution in any amount lessens the burdens for everyone. No one else is going to do it for you. Make a financial contribution at wruu.org. And thank you for your financial support of Savannah's best local talk radio, as voted by readers in the most recent Connect Savannah poll, WRUU 107.5 FM. Close message two. We need your support. All of the in-person fundraising events we normally have throughout the year have been canceled because of the coronavirus. Supporting WRUU with your financial gift is very important to us. If you made a one-time contribution to WRUU last year, consider changing that to a monthly gift this year. Monthly gifts help you help WRUU. They help you by spreading out a larger gift over a year's time. $10 a month is about 30 cents a day, but it adds up to $120 of support each year for your favorite radio station. Monthly gifts are automatically renewing, and you control when they start and stop. So there's no need to remember when your year of support is up, and we can count on that support every month to bring you great radio programming. We use the super easy PayPal website to make the transfer from your card to our account and you might already have a PayPal account. If not, it's one of the most trusted online money transfer methods that you can use for all types of online shopping. Go ahead and become a monthly contributor now. Find the details at wruu.org. And thanks for supporting Savannah's best local talk radio, as voted by readers in the most recent Connect Savannah poll, WRUU 107.5 FM. All right, everybody, we are back. And thank you so much for your consideration of a donation to support WRUU.org. Our website is where you can click on the link and hit the donate. And, uh, yeah, so Bill Cooper's in the house. Hey, Bill, how you doing? Hey, Adam, what's up? Oh, let me turn the thing on real quick. We're talking with Ryan Dunn today, man. Have How's a good time. How you doing, Ryan? How's it going? Oh, I need earphones. Anyway, I guess he's doing fine. <laughs> Yeah, he says he's doing good. Okay, yeah. um, listen, I, I, I got a little ghost music for you. And the only reason I'm doing this is poor bears. Oh, don't, can't... yeah. Okay, poor, uh, um, poor, bears doesn't play this poor is what I wanted to say. <laughs> so anyway, nice to meet you. And uh, here we go, just a little bit of holiday music, right? I was working in the lab late one night when my eyes beheld an eerie sight. <laughs> It was the mash. It was the, the monster, monster mash. The monster mash. <laughs> it was oh, a graveyard smash. smash. <laughs> Wasn't as good as Johnny Cash. It was the man. <laughs> That's it, folks. Awesome. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Bill Cooper, everybody. Bill Cooper. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Ryan says it's awesome. 
<laughs> yeah, man, uh, that's so crazy. You know, this, the funny thing about the Monster Mash, it was a song about another song that was never really a real song. Yeah, I know, right? Massachusetts, too, they wrote it. Man, oh. Massachusetts. Massachusetts? Yeah, Massachusetts. Massachusetts, huh? It was yeah, the mash. Was from, uh, Nis, uh, in fact, Nis Elm. Oh, really? I love his facial expressions on the the, 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 the That's the awesome. Spray. That's awesome. Yeah, that's one of my favorite. I remember uh, every year as a kid, they'd play that, and they played Thriller. Like, when Thriller came out in, I think, 83 or 84, something like that, maybe 82. I remember that. It's like every year. It's like not Halloween until you hear Thriller. Yep. Thriller. Thriller night. Yeah, I'm going to stick to my day job. <laughs> I'm not a good singer. <laughs> but, oh, yeah, they started playing it last month. So, um, Ryan, so we, we've been talking about, like, investigations and stuff like that. Do you mind if we talk a little bit more about the uh, the Devil's Due anthology? Yeah, definitely. Let's go for it. Yeah, so everybody, I, I know I, I talk about it from time to time, but uh, Valhalla Books, ValhallaBooks.com, that's my website for the – uh, publishing company and the reason why i decided i wanted to go with uh publishing making a small publishing press was because i wanted to work with other authors publishing them right and i thought an anthology w- would be a great way to do it because i like horror um i also wanted to be able to separate like my charitable stuff you know the books and brews savannah that we've done, you know, the quill, the convention, stuff like that, the meet and greets, where we're not really doing, you know, stuff to make profit on. I want to kind of, you know, separate that from the publishing side of it, you know, where we are trying to sell books and things like that. And so this this anthology, it's the devil's do nothing is ever as it seems. And it's it's an old premise of, you know, someone makes a deal with the devil. They think that they're going to be able to outwit the devil, and the devil always comes back calling, right? And you know, the person ends up. Yeah, pretty much the person ends up, you know, losing the deal. You know, they get what they want up front, but the devil always comes to collect, right? And so I asked Ryan if he would, because, you know, you're such an avid horror reader and you also are a big, have you know, a horror fan of movies and you know good storytelling. Like, you know, that's why yeah. you know good storytelling, especially with horror and, you know, you're a good storyteller yourself. Um, and I was like, wow, you know, I think it's so cool, especially with you doing the, uh, the tour company and, you know, you've done all these investigations and you know, I mean, like, you know, and it's a good story or it's not a good story. Um, so can you talk about like what your impression was when you started reading the anthology and, you know, what kind of stuck out for you? I just think it's neat because every single story has a different approach to the same classic theme. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's neat how Mark's, uh, Alan Gunnels is more of a fairy tale style. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Josh's was more, uh, to me, had a, uh, like a hard boiled detective kind of type story, almost like a crime type story, you know? Yeah. Um, and, or almost, and almost a revenge story, too. And how yours goes with the genie theme. It was just really nice how they all had the same type of idea, but completely different take on the, the stories. You know, there's nothing, none of the two stories are the same. Yeah, I I thought it was interesting because as the publisher and the editor, you know, the stories came in. I did the only thing that I set up for the anthology was that I wanted this premise. It had to be a deal with the devil that goes wrong. That was the premise. Right. And uh, but I did not I did not ask them. I, I, I didn't want to read any of it before they had the story done. So right. a couple of them asked me, you know, would you like to read the first thousand words? No. The only thing I did was like with the open call, I had uh, two authors that they they were kind of referrals, but they kind of weren't. It was just more like an open call. Right. And I had them send me a 75 word pitch. Right. And then, you know, there were a bunch of people that did that, but I only had like two that I liked. And from those two, I asked them to send me a 500 word treatment of the story. Right. Because I figured the first 500 words, I mean, that's like a typical newspaper article, you know, today. Right. And if you can't encapsulate, you know, something in 500 words, the next 1,000 or 1,500 words are not going to matter, you know? Right. Um, but that was the whole thing. And I was blown away, like, honestly, as a, as a reader, because I, I don't read as much fiction as I do nonfiction. I was blown away at, at the different levels and the different stories that they brought up, you know, that they all had their own perspectives of, um, 
you know, for example, with Bobby Nash, you know, set out west. Right. Uh, you know, like a, it was set like in a western, you know, theme or whatever. And um, like Rachel Brune, she had a, a detective story. Right. Um, but her detective story was nothing, comp- you know, completely different compared to like Josh's story, you know? Right. And that's what I thought was really cool. And like my story, uh, it was about an author. And uh, Elijah Hurt's story was about an author, but it was completely different. Right. You know, um, so I thought it was pretty cool. And, you know, working this is doing this first anthology um working as the publisher and editor and you know try to do all this different stuff there's a lot of nuts and bolts to it right yeah. and so you you know you do the same thing with your books you write you know you have you you don't do like an anthology per se but you have a collection of you know stories that investigations and stuff like that so it's very similar right you know, and you said that, you know, you have to figure out, you know, what you're going to put in and what you're you know going to leave out. Because, you know, case like year by year, like you, you don't want to have a laundry list of, you know, just whatever, right. you know. So how do you decide like what goes in and what, you know, what stays out when you're, you know, because obviously you wouldn't be like, oh, well, you know, like 1733, nothing happened. You know, 1734, right. you know, uh, plowing of the cornfield, you know, <laughs> I mean, that would be really boring. Yeah, I try to, you know, I guess find out what would interest me as a reader, too. Mm-hmm. And then I kind of have the same, you know, the all killer, no filler type of thing, you know. I want to have them really mm. short stories where it's all good, juicy tidbits. And the all only killer, filler no have, filler. It's just enough filler to really pull it together so that it reads well. But, you know, it's not a lot. I mean, just adding the adjectives and adverbs, you know, the little fluff like that. But even then, I try not to go too descriptive because it's not a, you know, a fiction story. So right. it's nice to have... To where it moves at a decent pace, you know, not too quick, but it's not dragging at all, you know. Uh, yeah, I love that. All killer, no filler. Yeah, I love that. I mean, where did you hear that, or did you come up with that? Um, no, it's actually from a uh, a band, Some Forty One. I'm not a you know huge fan. I mean, they're all right. They're pretty good for punk, you know, for some poppy punk. But mm-hmm. uh, I remember they had an album. I remember seeing on the shelves years and years ago called All Killer, No Filler. And Dude, like, hey, great way to put it, you know. That is. I mean, like you know, if I had to sum up writing, it should be All Killer, No Filler. Yeah, I mean, you want just enough filler to, you know, have those descript- descriptions and those things that make it fun to read. But at the same time, no one wants a, you know, 10-page description on a character, you know? So. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's weird because, um, gosh, uh, a couple months ago, I started a Ray Bradbury challenge of reading a poem, a short story, and an essay a night for a thousand nights. I got right. through I got through 54 nights of it, and then the last couple weeks I've taken a break. But it, it really opened my eyes up because I'd never read any Ray Bradbury stuff until, you know, I read the compulsory Fahrenheit 451 in like ninth grade English class. But I uh, started reading his short stories. And that's, I mean, I, that is a great way to describe like how he writes. You know, he doesn't write a bunch of fluff. I mean, it's the story leads, you know, each word leads to the next sentence, to the next paragraph. I mean, like it all adds in. You know, and I love I'm that. I'm going to read some more of his short stories. I've always been a fan as a kid. I used to watch the Ray Bradbury Theater show. Oh, my gosh. And the episode, he had one with Jeff Goldblum and another episode called The Singing Woman about a woman being buried alive by her husband, and she would sing at night to keep herself company. Mm. And that one had Drew Barrymore in the show. But again, that, that show, even going back now watching it, the one about The Singing Woman on the Ray Bradbury Theater is scary as heck. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the only thing I've read, read by him is Halloween Tree. You know, I want to read a lot more of his stuff because, you know, I love what he talks about. It, I it is. Some more. It blew me away. I mean, you talk about good storytelling. It blew me away because, you know, he, he focuses on the human condition too. And the characters, you know, they're believable. He doesn't do, you know, he doesn't do a whole lot of, you know, descriptive stuff either. Like, oh, Barry was five foot nine and black right. hair and, you know, a short curly beard and what? No, oh yeah, yeah. Sebastian said he's not like J.R.R. Tolkien. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which you know, there's a different reader for everybody. But I'm, I'm more of like, you know, I like to imagine the characters more myself. And yeah. like even with my uh, books, I one of the things that somebody said for my first one was that they would have liked to have more character description. And like my description was more of their actions and their behavior and the feelings and right. less on their physical, uh, appearance, I guess. Um, so I've always been one of those people like, 
I, I kind of I like to, to get to know their personality better, I guess, or like yeah, you know, their motives and that kind of thing and whatever. So, but I like that uh, all killer no filler stuff. So I think Anne Rice is one of my only you know authors. that's one of my favorites. That she'll get real descriptive and long winded, but at the same time, it's such a good description mm-hmm. that I, I it doesn't bother me. But you know, a lot of yeah. others I can't I can't do it. But for some reason, Anne Rice is the master of making it making it work. Yeah, I you know I, I have to agree with you on that. I, there's I'm not going to name it, but there's this audio book that I have been like grinding through, right? And every chapter is the same format and it's like they talk like this and there's no emotion and they're talking like you know i'm like dude and then at the end of the chapter they talk about the you know how to apply it to business and stuff like that and i'm like oh my gosh i'm just i've been i've been literally fast forwarding just to the end part of each chapter just so i can hear like the principles that they want to apply to business yeah. And they have some great principles. I mean, like, don't get me wrong. The the book itself has some great principles, but the storytelling is just so drab. I mean, I used to be like that. Me and Kim used to watch that show House, and I loved Hugh Laurie, and I loved House. But after the third season or so, I'm like, I get it. Somebody's going to have a disease. They yeah. can't figure it out. It's like the, the format was so formatted that after mm-hmm. a while – even though I love the characters, I, I just couldn't finish the seasons because I'm like, okay, I know it's going to be the same, kind of the same type of deal, you know? Mm-hmm. I felt that way with The Walking Dead. Yeah, oh gosh. I, the, the book I loved, but yeah. the, the, the show, I'm, I'm so glad they're ending it. Like, I, I wish they would just not drag it out so long. Well, you know, yeah. it was so cool at first, but then after a while, it was like, well, we're going to kill, you know, the character that we've been building up that you love. You know, right. and like it seemed like they did that every time they build one character up, like you know, you love that character, and they're like so heroic, or or maybe not, you know, like there's somebody that you hate, you know, but you love to hate them, you know, yeah, and then they kill them off, and it's like, oh, oh yeah, Sebastian was talking about the one where they did the black and white that one season. I just oh, I yeah. couldn't watch it anymore. And now they're doing the Beyond, which is a whole other thing. I'm like, why don't you just wrap it all up? I mean, it's great, but it's time. To, there's so many other authors. Like, I'm excited about Anne Rice's Vampire Chronicles and Witches Chronicles uh, coming out into. I think Hulu or somebody picked them up, and they could be doing a TV series, which is awesome because there's so many books in those series. It'd be great. Wow. I can't wait. I have to do it right, you know? Yeah. Everybody, you're listening today to the Adam Usher Show here on WRUULP Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings Community Radio with Global Soul. My special guest today has been Ryan Dunn. we got about 10 minutes left, uh, Ryan. Um, so you got another tour of, uh, like, another, like, lock-in coming up um, at Moon River Brewing Com- Company? Yeah, so we got one on Sunday, October 25th. We got a couple tickets. Last from 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. Mm. to 100 per person, and we're going to have access to the entire building for the night. Hmm. So when they do that, um, they're on the team for that night, right? Yeah. Yeah, they're part of our team, and we treat them just like an investigator, which is really cool. And then the uh, they have access to all the recordings and all that stuff, and you do Yeah, the... and they can use all of our equipment. They can bring some, too, if they like, but we bring equipment and everything. So. And you, I know that we were talking earlier about the uh, safe distancing and all that stuff. Um, how, how are you addressing that with the, the, uh, the lock-ins? Uh, with that, it's going to be, you know, we have four floors and a basement, so there's plenty of room for everybody to spread out. Mm -hmm. Um, so it won't be an issue. That's okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My dog's at the shop and he's Oh, you're fine. Yeah, you're totally fine. Okay. Sorry. He's, uh, I brought my dog with me today, so he's. Yeah, no worries. No worries. It's okay. We're a community radio station, man. It's, it's all good. <laughs> so, yeah, that's Griswold, my English bulldog. That's cool. So um, when they do the, the tour, um, not the tour, but the lock-in for that, because it's different than the tour, you all do the investigations. You said uh, earlier that uh, you have the live playback as well. Yeah, so we do live playback on the overnight lock-ins. So guests doing the overnight with us to be able to hear, you know, playback of EVPs and stuff too. And with that, it's it's just raw, it's raw recordings and stuff, right? Right, right. Yeah, full investigation mode and everything. So. Yeah, and you know, here this is a, a question I had. We were kind of talking about this earlier. 
But um, what are some like differences that people might think when they're like, let's say they've never gone on an investigation like this. Right. You know, I know you said earlier there was a lady who's like, oh, I was disappointed because there wasn't a ghost. What's something that, you know, uh, how it's different from what people would expect from TV to real life? Um, you know, it was funny. We had some, uh, there was some military guys from the overnight with us a couple of years ago, really nice guys. But the whole time we're getting EVPs on playback, people had actually caught photos of ghosts on location. I mean, people had seen shadow figures in the hallway. So it was a very active night. And they wanted to leave early. And I said, well, what's going on, guys? And they said, well, this isn't what we expected. Hmm. And I said, well, what do you mean? They said, we're expecting activity. And I'm like, well, we're getting a lot of it. They're like, yeah, but we wanted to be attacked. And they're pushed and scratched. And <laughs> what? And I'm like, I'm like, just because you aren't getting attacked, you're not, you know, it's just really weird. But I guess they had seen some of the ghost shows. And, you know, Zach from Ghost Adventures is notorious for yelling at ghosts to scratch them and stuff. So <laughs> I guess maybe they were trying to play into that, which is really odd. Mm. Yeah, real life's nothing like that. Yeah, nothing like it. So, yeah, it's kind of crazy uh, because it reminds me like the like you were just talking about the all killer no filler writing. Yeah, can be. I mean, like just my opinion here, but writing can be exhilarating, and then at other times it can be so boring. You know, um, it can be like it could be some of the f most fun thing in the world that you've ever done. And sometimes it's like one of the hardest things you've ever done, you know? And it's the same thing, I guess with, with that it's people think that a writer's life, you know, it's so glamorous and you, Oh, you get all these ideas and everything. It's like, really, it's just trying to, you know, type each sentence out, you know? Right. Or, or taking that crazy idea you wake up in the middle of the night with and figuring out, is this something that, you know, was, you want to do something with or not, or if you're going to have time to do it, you know? Yeah. So I guess expectations a lot different, you know, and people don't realize these shows, people are in there two days filming or maybe a whole night and you're seeing, you know, 30 minutes of the best of the best. So yeah, it's not you get the edited the entire time. Yeah. Yeah. So. You get the edited version of it. Right. Uh, the sound bite version of it, you know, right. that's, a, that's a, that's the thing I, I, I kind of enjoy doing with the show because we get a chance to talk a little bit more in depth about stuff than, you know, like a five to seven minute interview, you know? So what, uh, what else is on the horizon for next year? Um, I guess it depends with COVID, you know, if everything settles down, we want to travel and open up in a couple of more cities. We're huh. looking at doing sleepy hollow, New York, Salem, Massachusetts, wow. uh, Ybor city in Florida. And we're looking at Charleston and South Carolina. So oh, wow. those are all on our radar. And once things lighten up, you know, we're ready to go ahead and start moving into some more cities. So Wow. I didn't realize you were ready to expand that much. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. We're uh we got a business plan, we got everything going. Um just a matter of doing the investigations and the research and we've done it we've got a model of how we've done it in other cities. So I mean it's just a matter of carrying that over to the new cities, you know. So Yeah. So is Savannah's still gonna be your home base? Yeah, Savannah's still gonna be the home base. Um but of course, you know, as the kids get older, you know, our kids are homeschooled, so we can travel. So yeah, who knows where me and Kim and the family might end up, you know, with our travels, you know. And that was another thing we were expecting to hit the road a lot with the girls, and COVID put a damper in that. But of course, you know, we're gonna we still definitely expect to travel a lot same when it lightens up. Yeah, that that's a I think a really neat thing, um, you know, with the kind of company that you have set up, you know, because you have to be on location. Like you can't, yeah. you can't do stuff, you know, uh, remotely, you know, right. uh, gosh, I'm trying to think there was this, uh, there was this show. Oh my gosh. I'm trying to think of what it was. There was a show where they had this archeologist who <laughs> they had never visited the place that they were an expert on. See, that's ridiculous. Yeah. Like, and it's like, you know, they, everything they knew was from a book. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That'd be like if you were an Egyptologist and you'd never been to Egypt. Yeah, it just doesn't make sense. So. Yeah, so it's kind of cool. So, okay, uh, we got about two minutes left here. Um, where can people check out your stuff and Kim's stuff? Okay, so Kim's shop is on Facebook. It's called The Other Side. Uh, you can buy stuff right there from the shop. You can also go online and message her if anything you want. She can get it for you and ship anywhere. Um, 
We also have afterlifetours.net where you can buy tickets for St. Augustine or for Savannah tours uh, seven days a week in both cities. Savannah, we're at 8 o'clock and 10 o'clock, and St. Augustine, 8 o'clock and 10.30 tours. And then for the overnight at Moon River for October 25th, you can get the tickets there from calling the office at 912-398-7820. And then my books are also on our website and on Amazon.com uh, and BarnesandNoble.com, and there's Savannah's Afterlife and Savannah's Afterlife 2. You know, I uh, had posted that picture where I saw your book at the Barnes & Noble at the, uh, the Oglethorpe Mall. It was pretty cool. I was excited to see that, man. I'm glad. I'm glad it's still selling there and doing well. Yeah, and they had it right there. They had a a, a table full of uh, like local books, and it was like, what a minute! I, I know that guy. <laughs> that's so <laughs> oh, cool. That's great. Yeah. So, well, Ryan, thanks so much, man, for being on the show, and I really appreciate it. I'm excited about the Devil's Do coming out um, on Halloween, and uh, you know, I'm, I really appreciate you writing the forward on it, and you being you know the first person to read the stories. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm so excited that you really like the stories because, like I said, you know, you're an avid reader, you're a storyteller, and you know, for you to say that you really enjoyed it meant a lot to me. So thank you very much. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. So, all right, everybody, stay tuned because up next is the Savannah at Night group. <laughs> 